We're going to be addressing the riveting topic of um, public authorities and defences available to it, principally under uh, two sections of the Civil Liability Act, Section 42 and Section 43A. Um, it occurred to Justin and me when we were preparing this uh, talk that we might have, not for the first time, uh, overestimated our capacity to address issues in a limited amount of time and as a result we've decided that although we've advertised this as a discussion about um, sections 42 through to 46 of the Civil Liability Act, the time is best spent uh, addressing sections 42 and 43A which seems to be where most of the action is. So. Um, I, without further ado, will call on Justin to talk about 42, section 42, and particularly by reference to the recent Court of Appeal decision in Weber and Greater Hume Shire Council, about which you'll hear a fair bit, and uh, and then I'll address 43A. Justin. Thanks, Richard. Um, <clears throat> so I think you should have copies of the relevant sections that I'll be talking about, which is sections 5B, 5C and 42 of the Civil Liability Act of 2002. I think I've got to do this. Nope. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure of how much everyone knows about these provisions and what they mean and what they do, but I'll purpose I'm going to talk about is to try and just go through generally what it all means. Um, so section 42, as you probably have in front of you, it lists the principles that are applied to determining whether a public or other authority has a duty of care or has breach of duty of care, where um, in, in respect of proceedings for which civil liability has been as applies and section 41 of the Act talks about where that is relevant. Um, section 42 is described as a statutory defence. Um, which generally has been relied on by public authorities to argue that they don't own a, owe a breach, they haven't breached a duty of care because in reliance on section 42A, the authority lacks the necessary resources to take precautions that would have removed the particular risk of harm which a plaintiff claims caused the plaintiff to suffer injury or loss and because in reliance upon section 42B, the court cannot challenge a general allocation as opposed to a specific allocation of resources. Now I should say the relevance of what I'm talking about now is the interrelationship between sections 42, 5B and 5C is that that's what the Weber decision which Richard mentioned, which we're going to talk about, um, focused on. Um, so the interrelationship of these three sections arises because um, section 5B and 5C deals with when a duty of care is owed, they deal with whether the duty has been breached and in the context of public authorities, section 42 deals with similar questions and it sets out the principles that apply in determining whether a duty of care is owed and similarly whether a duty of care is breached. So there's, a, there's an interrelationship between those three provisions. Um, <coughs> the other aspect of the interrelationship is that section 5B um, specifies the matters to be taken into account to determine if a reasonable person would have taken precautions against the risk of harm, including the burden of taking precautions to avoid the risk of harm. And section 5CA talks about the burden of taking precautions to avoid the risk of harm, including the, which includes the burden of taking precautions to avoid similar risks of harm. Now those two provisions relate to section 42, as I said before, because it's relied upon by public authorities to say, well, effectively, we didn't have the resources to carry out the functions that needed to be undertaken to prevent the risk of harm that caused the injury to the plaintiff. So that's how those three provisions generally inter interrelate. <clears throat> so moving on to the second slide. Um, so the Civil Liability Act came in in 2002, 18 years ago. Um, the decision of Justice Campbell in Roads and Traffic Authority of New South Wales and Refrigerated Roadways the 2009 decision of the Court of Appeal, that set out generally what's been regarded as the principles that should be applied and adopted in understanding Section 42. And in a moment, I'll talk about what Justice Bastian talk, uh, considered in the Weber decision, which is a 2009 decision, um, in, in the context of what was said by Justice Campbell. Now, I should say before I talk about all this stuff, it's very heavy. It's, 
but I'll make it as interesting as I can. Um, but there's a lot of detail in what the two judges say about Section 42. But at the end, when you get through all that, you get to a point where there's um, some things we can say about how Section 42 should be applied now, having regard to what Justice Bastian said in the decision of Weber. But going back to refrigerated roadways, um, generally, well, by background, um, a concrete block was dropped off a, off a roadway, a bridge. Um, it hit a truck. It killed the driver, unfortunately. Um, an issue in the case was a case brought by his relatives for damages um, was whether or not the RTA was negligent in failing to erect a screen along the bridge so that rocks couldn't be thrown off. Um, in the context of Section 42, which was raised as a defence by the Council in that matter, um, a number of propositions were put forward by Justice Campbell. And just briefly going through those, and this is in the context of the section that you have in front of you, um, the, sec the effect of Section 42A is that what an authority can be required by the law of negligence to do is limited by the financial and other resources that are reasonably available to the authority for the carrying out of functions required to be exercised by the authority. The second proposition he, his honour proposed was that in relation to Section 42B, the use of the expression those resources refers back to so Section 42A. So when S Section 42B requires what not to be challenged was the general allocation of the resources as opposed to the spe specific allocation of resources. Um, so what he's on a note was, on the one hand, Section 42A is concerned with the resources reasonably available to the authority, whereas Section 42B is concerned with the allocation of those resources by the authority. Um, the other point he's on a made was the effect of the word general in Section 42B seems to be drawing a distinction between the general and the specific. Um, such that in considering any particular allocation of resources, the court has to look at whether a decision about the allocation of resources was general or specific. Um, the force of the words is not open to challenge in section 42B is to prohibit the matter of contending um, that a public or other authority is under a duty of care or has breached duty of care. Um, importantly, and this is a, a point made by His Honour that was followed and discussed by Justice Bastian in Weber, his honour noted that if one allocation had been that the RTA had misapplied well-established principles and made careless factual errors in the way it prioritised overpasses for screening, the challenge that was being made would have been to the allocation of resources that had actually been allocated to the bridge screening, not the allocation of general resources. So what this is all talking about is you've got, on the one hand, a plaintiff can't challenge the general allocation of resources where resources are put into a certain purpose or function, whereas it can challenge the specific allocation resources, which is um, for the purposes of section 42B means that the 42B defence can be relied upon by a public authority to effectively say we're not liable for breach of duty of care for not um, spending money where we've allocated that money to other functions. But if there is an allocation of money to a specific function, there can be a challenge to that allocation. And that's what the distinction in 42B is talked about in the decision of um, refrigerated roadways. Um, so these propositions were set out by His Honour and they've been adopted for about 10 years. Um, up until 2019 when the decision of Weber was handed down and Justice Bastian in the decision of Weber makes some general statements about um, the interrelationship of the sections that I mentioned a moment ago and um, raises doubt as to whether some of the dicta that were raised by Justice Campbell um, should be applied and followed. So moving on to Weber. The background facts to this case were that, well, before I say that, just as a general summation of what Justice Bastian identified were that his honour refers in the judgment to a degree of obscurity in establishing a coherent operation of section 42 in the context of section 5B and 5C. And that that's basically a conclusion that I'll come to at the end of the, of the talk that his honour raises a number of questions about how you can interpret and apply section 42 in the context of section 5B and 5C and that 
probably opens the door to other cases being run that can reinterpret or argue the way in which His Honour has interpreted these provisions. Um, His Honour raised doubts, as I said, about some of the dicta that were raised by Justice Campbell in Refrigerated Railways. His Honour put forward six <coughs> propositions in the decision of Weber as to how um, Section 42 should operate in the context of Section 5B and 5C. Um, His Honour noted that although Section 42 is not technically a defence, um, the, the most important aspect of the provision is the, um, the evidence that needs to be relied upon and presented by a public authority for the, to establish an, um, the, the defence so that it can be um, relied upon. Um, and that's important because, as I'll mention in a moment, there's a number of authorities that have identified the nature and the extent of the evidence that you need or a public authority needs to rely upon for this Section 40 defence to be successful. Um, His Honour also confirmed that the nature of the evidence required for the court to apply was a specific um, limited def uh, evidence, which was, and I'll mention that in a moment. Um, the facts in Weber, as I was met, going to say was there was a fire at a tip in a place called Walla Walla. Um, it was the tip was operated by the council. The fire spread a distance of approximately 11 kilometres to a place called Thank you. Gerudgery. Um The fire destroyed the plaintiff's property and other properties. I was going to struggle with that, but thank you for your help. Um, the plaintiff commenced representative proceedings for damages, alleging the council had um, failed to take re reasonable steps to prevent the fire at the tip and prevent the fire from spreading from the tip. Um, for the purposes of Section 5B, which deals with the risk issue, the plaintiff alleged that the relevant risk of harm was the risk of the fire escaping from the tip. Uh, when a fire had been ignited at the tip. The plaintiff further alleged that the council failed to take certain precautions to prevent the spread of the fire, and they included implementing a fire management plan, creating effective fire break, uh, consolidating deposited waste into appropriate areas, removing fuel and installing firefighting equipment, and there are others as well. Um, at first instance, the trial judge held that the council owed the duty of care um, to avoid the risk of personal injury as a consequence of the fire. And, and further held that there was a breach of the duty by failing to take precautions to prevent the spread of the fire. Unfortunately for the plaintiff, the claim was dismissed because the, his honour, well, the trial judge found that the plaintiff had not demonstrated factual, causa factual causation as to the cause of the fire could not be proven. And the plaintiff failed to demonstrate that if the reasonable precautions were taken, they would have prevented the escape of the fire from the tip. Um, the council at first instance relied on section 42 that argued it had not breached the duty of care because the risk of harm was the risk of fire escaping from the council's lands and therefore having regard to section 5CA and 42C it required a consideration of the expenditure across 10 waste disposal sites and facilities operated the council and the costs of addressing similar risks of other land owned and occupied by the council so the council was arguing the burden of preventing or avoiding the risk was such that the court should have taken into account the cost of doing all those things and that cost we couldn't um, meet and therefore we should have successfully um, been able to rely on section 42. Um, and the council further argued that it had no, signif so no significant funds available to it to spend on the test 10 waste disposal sites under its control. Um, it further argued that if further resources had been um, if the plaintiff had argued that further resources should have been relied on that had been allocated, that would have been a, an attack on the general allocation of resources, which was prohibited by Section 42B. Um, the trial judge held that the effect of 40, Section 42A is that what the defendant can be required to do is limited by the financial and other resources reasonably available to the defendant for carrying out the care, control and management of the 10 tips that it was required to manage. Section 42B prohibited a challenge to the general allocation of resources to for that purpose, and the plaintiff was able to address the specific allocation of resources to the care and control of management of the tips that could attack that issue. Um, there was a necessary approach to the reasonableness of a suggested action or precaution at the tip on the basis of being repeated across all 10 tips. Uh, ultimately, the Section 42 defence was not made out because the court held that the defendant had sufficient funds in its waste management budget to um, undertake the task or the precautions that were relied upon or argued by the plaintiff that would have prevented the harm that it suffered. 
The plaintiff successfully appealed the issue of causation, so it won in the Court of Appeal. Um, in the Court of Appeal, the counsel filed a notice of contention challenging the judge's findings in relation to Section 42 defence. In considering um, the Section 42 notice of contention and the grounds upon which the, court, the counsel argued the trial judge erred, um, this is where, in the decision of Weber, His Honour Justice Bastion undertakes um, a thorough assessment of what Section 42 is, why it was there and what was its purpose. And in that process, he identifies these problems that I mentioned earlier in relation to the interrelationship of Section 42 in the context of Section 5B and 5C. And just quickly going through some of the problems His Honour identified, they included the drafting of Section 42 is awkward in that Section 42A provides that the functions required to be exercised by the authority are limited by the financial and other resources that are reasonably available. He's on a noted it's surely the resources available for the exercise of functions which are limited and not the functions themselves. <coughs> the second point he's on a made was that it's unclear as to how the burden of taking precautions in Section 5B2C is to be assessed. The council contended that the burden of taking precautions is to assess by reference to the broad range of the council's activities as the functions required to be exercised by the authority for the purposes of Section 42C, which in that case required, the council argued, required regard to be had to the fire precautions on all land owned, managed and controlled by the council against the risk of fire escaping from those lands. His Honour noted in respect of that interpretation, if that was the correct interpretation to be given to these provisions, um, it was supported by the burden in Section 5C as including the burden of taking precautions to avoid similar risks of harm, but the reading imposed a contextual limitation on the general language of Section 42C because it limited the inquiry to the necessary precautions to address a single risk of harm. And it, the other point His Honour made was that such a reading had the potential to expand significantly the scope of inquiry because it, I guess it meant instead of just looking at where an allocation has been made for the waste management of the 10 tips, the council argued that you could go outside of that and look at other areas it had allocated expenditure to for avoiding the risk of fire um, spreading across other acreage it owned. And I think the council was in control of it. The council was in control of about 6,000 square kilometres of land. So that meant his honour um, suggested would have been a, quite an onerous um, exercise for the council and the court to consider if that, if that um, interpretation was adopted. The third issue his honour noted was in relation to the difficulty of finding an interrelationship between these provisions was that the burden of a public authority taking particular precautions, in assessing the burden of public authority taking particular precautions to avoid a risk of harm for the purposes of section 5B2C and 5CA of the Act, the court's required to work on the principle that the performance of a duty of care is limited by the financial and other resources that are reasonably available to the public authority. That's section 42A. His Honour noted that although the court is permitted to consider what resources are reasonably available in a particular case, that exercise is constrained by the principle that the general allocation of those resources by authority is not open to challenges. It's a challenge in section 42B. So his honour is identifying two conflicting um, provisions within this legislation that are limiting, in a way, how the court can interpret and apply these um, arguments being raised by the council. In reliance on those provisions, the council argued that the, meant that the resources available to manage the TIP were those in fact allocated by the council in its budget and that it was not open to the court to consider whether those funds available to the council could reasonably have been allocated to meeting the cost of any necessary precautions. His Honour then went on to identify the purpose of section 42 and he refers to the recommendations in the IP committee's review of the law of negligence which is a report from September 2002 and His Honour goes through, um, which I won't probably go through now, various issues that arose in relation to that report and why section 42 was introduced and that's dealt with in the paper that Richard and I have prepared. Um, but ultimately his honour concluded that the report didn't give any direct assistance to an understanding of the interrelationship between sections 5B, C and 42. Um, 
His Honour then moved on and considered the, ver the case law that was applicable to section 42, including focusing on refrigerated roadways. And His Honour um, queried a number of um, statements that were put forward by Justice Campbell in refrigerated roadways and claimed what, that suggested that those um, statements of, of interpretation were open to doubt. Um, again, they're set out in the in the um, in the paper that we've prepared, and they're quite detailed. And they're in, but I think if you read through them, if you get the paper or download it, you can see that there's um, some quite um, involved assessment of the statements made by Justice Campbell um, in the context of interpreting 42A, B, and 5C and 5B. But what um, what was clear was that. In that assessment of um, Justice Campbell's comments, his honour in Weber um, referred to, in particular, which is relevant to the decision in Weber, um, the statement of Justice Campbell that, where he considered that it was open to the court without undertaking a challenge of the general allocation of resources to consider a negligent exercise of its functions in fixing priorities for the allocation of resources with respect to the construction of screens along overpasses on freeways. In respect of that statement by Justice Campbell, Justice Bastian said there is no doubt that the scope of the phrase, the general allocation of those resources, is unclear. If general is in relation to the allocation of funds is intended to be contrasted with specific allocations, the purpose of the provision is obscure. If the purpose of section 42 is to exclude from judicial review in a tort claim financial decisions based on policy grounds, the distinction between general and specific decisions is misconceived. And he's on a concluded that the better understanding of section 42b is that the council, a council may rely upon the limited resources available to it based on evidence that at the relevant time there were insufficient or no funds which had been allocated to other purposes. And I think this is relevant to the point I'll make in a moment about the, the evidence that needs to be relied upon by a council or public authority that if it's going to succeed in establishing a defence under section 42a or b. Um, he's on a, also noted that the comment or the statement in, by Justice Campbell in Refrigerated Railways that a court could consider, could consider whether the authority has made careless factual errors in the way it prioritised overpasses for screening so that absent such errors of bridge in question would have been screened would only arise if that allocation had, allegation had been made but in Refrigerated Railways it was not an allegation made by the plaintiff and consequently his honour Justice Bastian refers to as a hypothetical pleading in um, Weber. Um, his honour concluded that whether these dicta in refrigerated railways are, f are followed will await a case that determines that. Um, then his honour moved on to set out a number of pro propositions that um, should be applied or adopted in considering the operation of section 42 in the context of section 5b and c. He's on an, these propositions include, there were six of them, um, the requirements in section 5b, 2c and 5ca that the court considered the burden of taking precautions refers in relation to a public authority to the allocation of necessary financial and other resources additional to those already deployed to achieve the precautions that would have been taken by the re reasonable council. That assessment must be taken into account the additional burden that would be required to avoid similar risks of harm in other activities conducted by the authority. In de determining whether it would be reasonable to require the taking of additional precautions, the court must apply as a principle the assumed fact that such financial and other resources are, as are reasonably available are limited. That's in relation to section 42A. But it's not to say that the court cannot find that an additional allocation of resources was reasonably required to meet the risk of harm. Fourthly, the reference to functions required to be exercised by authority in section 42A is limited to understanding as is limited to the understanding of referring to functions that may be involved similar risks of harm so as to operate coherently with section 5CA. The um, phrase broad range of activities in section 42C would not require reference to activities of the council maintaining libraries, roads or other surfaces with no direct relationship to the operation of waste management sites nor would it include management of council's land not used for waste disposal. So I think the court's, uh, he's on as saying, 
there's funding set aside for waste management to manage the 10 sites, the 10 tips. There's also funds available for managing, managing acreage, which the council was arguing should all be taken into account. His Honour was saying, no, you've got to limit it to the functions that relate to the purpose for which um, the relevant case is being run and the claim is being made by the plaintiff. Um, so the court is not, not permitted to allow the plaintiff to challenge the general allocation of those resources, being the resources that, res that are reasonably available for the exercise of the function, identified in section 42A, as understood in accordance with the broad range of activities identified by section 42C. What is prohibited is the conclusion that additional resources should have been made available, although they had at the relevant time be allocated the exercise of those functions. Um, after identifying these principles, His Honour stated that that if this understanding of section 42 read in the context of section 5b and c is correct, it's likely to deal efficiently with the plaintiff's claim. Um, because from one view, his honour said, the purpose of section 42 is to limit proceedings and to limit the amount of evidence that needs to be relied upon by a defendant, council or public authority, um, such that the council would only be focusing on financial resources or documents that go to the financial resources in respect of the particular function that's relevant to the plaintiff's claim, not functions and other processes outside of that claim. Um, so uh, the the outcome of the decision ultimately is that, well, the council, sorry, I should go back. The council was unsuccessful in the section, in respect of the section 42 appeal um, on the basis that his honour held whatever may be the scope of the general allocation which cannot be challenged pursuant to section 42B, there'd be an, his honour held that there'd be an inherent tension in permitting the council to require the court to have regard to the use of resources in areas of activity unrelated to the kind of activity which caused harm to the plaintiff whilst precluding any challenge by the plaintiff to the allocation of resources across, across a range of activities. So the plaintiff can't challenge the general allocation, and the, His Honour was say, stating, I think, that the Council equally can't rely on evidence of general allocations to try and rely on Section 42. Um, and he, His Honour concluded that that approach is, as I said before, consistent with the cost of litigation and reducing that cost. And ultimately, in this case, I think the finding was that Section 42 defence was not made out because having regard to the limited view or the narrow view of looking at the 10 sites, there was enough funds within um, the reserve of the council to pay for the um, cost of carrying out the precautions that the plaintiff argued had they been taken out, carried out, would have prevented the risk of harm and the damage to the plaintiff. Um, so, his Honour also discusses a decision of Holroyd City Council and Zeta, Z-A-I-T-E-R. That's in the context, it's a New South Wales Court of Appeal decision of 2014. The plaintiff was injured when he rode a bike um, down a grass slope into a concrete drainage channel at a Hol Holroyd Sports Ground. A pole advertising, um, sorry, an advertising sign stood on the sports ground and the council used the sign to generate income to pay for the upkeep of the the ground. Um, a fence was erected after the accident, but the issue is whether or not, um, for the purposes of Section 42, the Council could argue that it had allocated funds from this source being the advertising revenue from the poll, and that was a that was a general allocation of resources which should not have been challenged by the by the plaintiff um, and could be relied upon by the defendant under Section 42 as a defence to the claim. Um, what the court held in that matter, Justice Hoban held, was that the appellant's submission, that, that is the council's submission, that once it had determined that the sole source of funding for the improvements to the sports ground was to be the re review from the advertising poll sign, was a general allocation of resources that could not be challenged, was contrary to what Justice Campbell had said in refrigerated roadways and that the decision was part of the general allocation under either the heading of public order or safety or recreation and culture, which were the headings used by the appellant in the financial statements. 
The general allocation of monies by the appellant to such functions cannot be challenged, but the allocation within those functions can. So in other words, the reasonable sort of decision that the revenue from the advertising poll sign is to be the sole source of funding for the sports ground is not protected by the revision of section 42B um, and was subject to challenge. Um, so the two decisions of Weber and Zeta stand for the proposition that section 42 allows the court to consider the availability of unallocated funds that are held by the council or public authority but not challenge the way in which the general allocation of those resources are used. Um, just the other things that come out of, um, very quickly, the other things that come out of um, Weber are that there was a decision of Kempsey Shire Council and Five Star Medical Centre, which is a 2018 New South Wales Court of Appeal decision. A plane crashed at Kempsey Airport. Airport. Sorry, it came into land, hit a kangaroo. The owner of the plane sued the council for not erecting a fence around the airport to prevent the kangaroos getting in. Um, the issue in this case was whether the question, the de definition of function in section 41 and section 42 should be restricted or should be um, expanded. Um, the trial judge held that function should be what the, the legal functions of the, of the council are. It's limited to that. The Court of Appeal had held that no, the functions are um, what the functions of council for the purpose of section 42 are is what are required, what the council is required to perform and apply. Um, in addition to their legal functions, it, it's uh, functions that are expand to um, response to requirements imposed by needs of the community as understood by the council. In that case, those needs were outlined in section 24 of the Local Government Act. Um, so the relevance of the decision of Kempsey was that in Weber, Bastion refers to an expansive definition of function in section 42A. So that in respect of councils, that's, that's seemed, that is the current position of what function should, how function should be determined, sorry, defined. Um, in refrigerated roadways, Campbell noted that section 42 is a matter the defendant must plead. And once it's pleaded, the pr principles in section 42 must be taken into account in deciding whether there has been a breach of a duty of care. In Weber, his Honour Justice Bastion noted that Section 42 is not um, technically a defence because it sets out principles that are taken into account deciding whether a public authority owes a duty of care or has breached a duty of care. But having said that, His Honour then noted and observed that a defendant may obviously well be advised to plead Section 42 and the, the relevant authority has established that and I don't think His Honour's comments in Weber have changed the position that a defence should indicate reliance on section 42, otherwise issues of procedural fairness arise. Section 42, if it's going to be pleaded as a defence, needs to give particulars of the facts which were said to give rise to the consideration of section 42. By simply pleading section, the language of section 42 without pleading any of the underlying facts, the pleading's been held to be defective. Um, section 42 is not available as a standalone defence to a plaintiff's claim where the claim is not concerned with the breach of duty of care. And that, an example of that is a, in a claim for nuisance. Um, and finally, section 42B may be pleaded as a defence even if section 42A is not engaged or relied upon because section 42B does not ex depend on the engagement of section 42A but merely re refers back to section 42A. So there's some, they're, they're things to take into account and consider when drafting pleadings that, in which a council or public authority wishes to rely on section 42 and as I said they're more set out in the paper. Finally, um, I don't know how much time I've got, I'll probably run out of time and I probably forgot to do this. There. Okay, um, evidence. Um, the most, Justice Bastian said in Weber, the most important matter is the burden at least with respect to reducing evidence of the relevant factual material relied upon by a public authority. So. What's important, obviously, is to have the evidence that's going to support a Section 42 defence. And the authorities stand for the following propositions that, firstly, a court's unable to apply the principles in Section 42 unless the evidence that's presented um, is of the financial and other resources available to the authority, the general allocation of those resources is by the authority, and the range of the authority's activities. 
Furthermore, if a public authority uses specific evidence as the budget, state of its assets, its budgetary allocations, expenditure in the year the accident occurred, and the predicted cost of having carried out the works that would have avoided the risk of harm to the plaintiff, it's then necessary for the court to engage in some analysis of the evidence for that for the purposes of section 42. And if that doesn't happen, it's been held that that's an error by the court. Where section 42 depends on a particular interpretation of a series of financial statements in relation to the financial affairs of the public authority, the financial statements, if the financial statements are not explained or ambiguous or fail to unequivocally show that there is an there was an insufficient funds available to relevant authorities to pay for the precautions that were deemed necessary to move the risk of harm, a public authority cannot raise section 42B. So it's important that the financial statements are clear, not ambiguous, and unequivocally show that there was insufficient funds in the allocated for the allocated functions relevant to the claim. And finally, the tender of large volumes of accounting material and financial records should be avoided because Justice Bastian and Weber said, you only really need to put on evidence that shows unequivocally that you'd, the council or the public authority didn't have available unallocated funds that could have been spent to prevent, to prevent the, um, the risk of harm. I don't know how long I've spoken for, but it seems like a while. Too long. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. um. Thanks, Justin. Uh, my focus, was, as I said earlier, was uh, is to be on section 43A, and there are many features to that section, but I thought, uh, given the amount of time available, I should focus on just two aspects of it and do so largely by reference to two cases, one of which, happily enough, is uh, Weber, uh, and the other is an earlier decision of the Court of Appeal in McKenna, a decision that was subsequently overturned in the High Court, but for reasons I'll come to, nevertheless what was said by the Court of Appeal before being overturned in the High Court might, may uh, bear on uh, what we're about tonight. Um, I, I've, I think, handed out uh, copies of, a, of the section itself and uh, as Justin mentioned there is a paper that we've uploaded to the website that might um, fill in some of the gaps that uh, you're about to uh, realise here. Um, so I won't labour the wording of the section. Um, I'll come back to particular parts of it and there are various definitions that again I, I won't labour, um, but it's perhaps enough to recognise that there are defined terms aplenty in uh, 43A and in uh, part five in which it belongs. Um, but I think the important point about section 43A is that it, it, thro it throws up two stages of inquiry it's, um, to which I'm about to come, but the, the first um, point to remember is that subsection 3 uh, establishes a when three unreasonableness test um, so that the, the act or omission of the public authority to the extent that it involves the exercise or failure to exercise a special statutory power um, d does not uh, give rise to civil liability unless the act or omission was in the circumstances so unreasonable that no public authority or no authority having the special statutory power in question could properly have, um, or could have, could have regarded that decision as, as reasonable. So it's a very high bar that people might remember from law school, admin law days, um, uh, was established in the Wensbury Unreasonable Authorities. Um, I, I mentioned there's a two a two stage inquiry. I, subsection three um, establishes this this two step approach. So it, it, as I read it, the section contemplates that before it'll do any work, there, there has to be um, a negligent exercise or a negligent failure to exercise a power. And um, usually the section would be invoked after a finding of negligence and operate as a defence to civil liability. Uh, I say usually, but not always, because in um, a Court of Appeal decision in 2016, Bankstown City Council and Zraker, which is cited in the paper, um, the Court of Appeal held that it was not necessary to determine the nature of the duty owed by the council in that case because it was so clear that the very high test in um, subsection 3, the, the Wensbury unreasonableness test, um, could not be made out. So the court was able to deal with the appeal without getting into the messy topic of what was the content of the duty of care that the council owed. Um, 
the short point is that 43A involves this two-step approach. It requires the plaintiff first to make out negligence by reference to the usual Section 5B inquiry and then to satisfy the further but not inconsistent statutory test um, established by, by 43A. Um, I, I mentioned there'll be two decisions um, that I'll be referring to, Weber and um, McKenna. Um, McKenna was decided in 2013, um, a, f a few years before um, Weber, but it, c it considers um, many issues, including the Section 5A Competent Professional Practice Defence. Um, and its value as a precedent has been thrown into question by the fact that um, it was overturned uh, on appeal to the High Court. Um, but the High Court overturned the Court of Appeals decision in, in McKenna on a single ground, um, finding that the courts below had erred on the question of the duty of care, and for that reason regarded as unnecessary to consider the hospitals, and I'll come to the facts in McKenna in a moment, but the, the appellant's other appeal grounds, which included 43A and Section 5A, were, were not determined by the High Court, uh, and so there was no um, High Court review of the reasoning of the Court of Appeal in on those questions. And subsequently, in a, a decision of the Court of Appeal in Sparks and Hobson, um, Justice Baston expressed the view that because McKenna, the, the Court of Appeal's decision in McKenna had been overturned by the High Court, um, none of the reasoning in the Court of Appeal's decision was binding. Uh, whereas Justice Simpson, in that same case, regarded uh, the decision as binding, the, the reasoning in so much of McKenna as was not dealt with by the High Court, Her Honour regarded uh, the Court of Appeal's reasoning as binding, as did Justice McFarlane. And for what it might be worth, um, in my humble submission, if one <laughs> considers the reasoning by which Justice Baston arrived at the conclusion that um, the Court of Appeal's reasoning in uh, McKenna was not binding in any way, um, is to be preferred to that of the other two judges for the reason that the other two judges with respect don't um, actually engage on why they regarded uh, the earlier reasoning uh, in McKenna of the Court of Appeal in, as binding. Um, it may be, um, if I can put it this way, understandable that Justice McFarlane in Sparks and Hobson regarded uh, the reasoning in McKenna, the Court of Appeal in, uh, as still binding because his honour Justice McFarlane sat on the um, on the earlier McKenna decision, but um, and unsurprisingly, Justice McFarlane in Sparks and Hobson thought that what Justice McFarlane said in McKenna was, was right. <laughs> um, in any event, uh, I, I can't answer the question whether <laughs> the reasoning in McKenna is binding, but I, I'll wager that the next time that issue comes up, Justice Baston's approach will be preferred. Um, in um, Weber, relevantly as to Section 43A, the, the judges um, arrived at the conclusion that the section was not engaged for two reasons. Firstly, that the council's management of the TIP was not under, undertaken pursuant to a special statutory power. Um, and secondly, um, or at least as a consequence, general law principles of negligence applied. Um, I mentioned that there were two steps established in uh, McKenna, uh, established in uh, Weber, that is a two-step approach to um, determining whether um, 43A is engaged or not. In Justice Baston, with, the other, with whom the other two judges agreed in Weber, said that the first um, step to, to addressing whether 43A is engaged and available to the public authority is to identify the basis of the liability relied on by the plaintiff. And in that case, it was said to be the failure of the council to undertake identified precautions in the management of the TIP. And as Justin mentioned, the identified precautions were uh, somewhat rudimentary measures such as constructing fire breaks, re reducing fuel loads and compacting fill onto the top of the dumped refuse. So that was said to be firstly the, the basis of the liability uh, on which the council was sued by the plaintiff. And the second step was to determine whether those activities, namely precautions, constructing fire breaks, reducing fuel loads and compacting fuel, etc., um, could be regarded as um, activities that involve the exercise of a power conferred by a statute of a kind that persons generally are not authorised to exercise without such authority. And the short 
point, to leap to the end uh, early, is that the, the court determined that, um, or determined neither uh, issue favourably to the defendant counsel. Namely, it was held that those activities of uh, constructing fire breaks, etc., uh, involved no exercise of a power conferred by a statute. In short, I think the point was that anybody operating a tip could could undertake those activities, and therefore it wasn't necessary to for the council to point to any statutory obligation to do so. Um, and just a reminder. Uh, of what subsection one um, ha has to say. The, the section applies to proceedings for civil liability to which this part applies to the extent that the liability is based on a public or other authorities exercise, etc. And it's those, t those words is based on that I think uh, was the genesis for Justice Baston to begin the inquiry by asking what is the basis of liability that the plaintiff contends for. Um, and in, in most cases, as, in, as it was in Weber, the task of determining what is the basis of liability for which the plaintiff contends can be answered by simply looking at the pleadings, um, usually the particulars of negligence and um, the material facts said to give rise to the breach, the, the listing of the precautions against the risk of harm that might be propounded in the statement of claim. One would expect that in, in the usual well-pleaded case against a public authority, you'd be able to discern from it what is said to be the basis of liability. But that is why I've chucked uh, McKenna onto the uh, agenda tonight, because um, what, what, are, what, are, what are the cases where the pleadings arguably conceal the true nature of the case that's being advanced? Should, should the task of discerning the liability relied upon by the plaintiff involved resort to only the pleadings, or should one, is it permissible to stand back and from the pleadings and look at the real substantive case that's being put against the defendant. And that was uh, a live issue in McKenna for this reason. Um, McKenna involved uh, a, a, a psychiatrically disturbed, a, a, patient, a patient, Mr Pettigrove, who had uh, a long history of psychosis. He was um, camping in, in the bush near Taree with his mate for several weeks. He'd been off his meds for about six weeks. He started to behave erratically around the campfire. His mate uh, had enough insight um, to realise there was something wrong and brought Mr. McKe brought Mr. Pettigrove into the nearest hospital, the Manning Base Hospital, which had a psychiatric unit. And Mr. Pettigrove was admitted under Section 21 of the Mental Health Act, as it then read, which was um, a provision that entitled a medico to or ob obliged a, 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 a hospital to detain um, a, a patient if a medico certified that the patient was um, mentally ill or mentally disordered and that the patient's, effectively the patient's best interests lay in being admitted. Um, that, that's not an exact uh, paraphrase of the uh, section, but that's the thrust of it. Um, and uh, Mr... There's a long history to this, but the short point is that Mr Pettigrove was kept for about 36 hours during which he was medicated down from the psychotic state in which he presented. And there was a... He hailed from Victoria, from Echuca, as did Mr Rose, his friend who'd brought him in from the campsite. And um, all his treating doctors were back in Echuca. His mother, he lived at home with... When he wasn't camping in the bush at Taree, he was living at home with his mum in uh, Echuca. And uh, he expressed the strong desire while during the 36 hours of admission and while his um, pre presentation improved uh, to get home to mum and there was a telephone conference call convened but with the treating psychiatrist at the hospital, Mr Rose, Mr Pettigrove the patient and Mrs, Mrs Pettigrove on the phone from Echuca and it was resolved that um, his desire to get home to mum should be um, facilitated if that was possible and as it turned out Mr Rose had a car and was offering to drive his mate back home to mum. And so it was resolved during that conference um, that they'd watch him overnight, and if he, did, if he was still on the improve in the morning, they'd discharge him, and that's what occurred. And tragically, he was discharged into the care of Mr Rose. The pair uh, drove off from the hospital, and about a half an hour down the road, they stopped for a coffee, uh, and um, Mr Pettigrove, one in furs from, from being in the middle of another psych psychotic um, state um, strangled his mate Mr Rose and killed him. 
Um, and then later, Mr. Pettigrove uh, hanged himself in jail, so he wasn't, there wasn't any real um, possibility, uh, 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 option of establishing from Mr. Pettigrove what was, what motivated his actions in killing his friend. But the um, mother and parent, uh, mother and siblings of Mr. Rose sued uh, the hospital, um, uh, alleging that um, they negligently discharged him and um, the decision uh, to discharge was was uh, informed by section 35 subsection 3 of the mental health act as it then read which was that once um, the medical superintendent formed the view that the patients that there was um, care of a less restrictive kind of, uh, that was appropriate and reasonably available to the person the person must not be further detained so the whole point of the legislation is to ensure that only people are only detained in the as a, as a last resort and so the the decision to discharge him into the care of Mr Rose for the drive home to Echuca to mum and the treaters was based on that provision and in the case as it was pleaded by the uh, on behalf of the plaintiffs in the which was in the district court there wasn't a single reference to any of the provisions of the mental health act the particulars of negligence simply read relevantly that there were four failings on the part of the hospital, that is failing to detain Mr Pettigrove until he was properly medicated, discharging him notwithstanding that his condition or his conditional behaviour was unmedicated as, as they had it, discharging him when he was in a condition that um, represented a significant risk etc. So so the, the clear nub of what was being put against the defendant hospital was that it discharged Pettigrove when it should not have. Now. Well, Ordinarily, you would expect that the plaintiff would plead the provisions of the various legislation that they it, that they would contend obliged the plaintiff to be kept in or not to be discharged, but that didn't happen. And I suspect, I've long suspected, I was involved in McKenna throughout from the trial right through to the High Court overturning it. But in the at the trial, I, I long suspected that uh, that the plaintiff deliberately avoided mentioning any making any reference to. The, the Mental Health Act and the obligations under it because they were trying to avoid a 43A defence. But we pleaded 43A nevertheless. Um, uh, we, we argued that um, the discharge of him was mandated by Section 35.3. There was no um, choice available to us. We, um, once we reasoned, or once we'd formed the view through the psychiatrist that the patient was better off with mum, then that represented care of, a, of the least restrictive kind and he had to be discharged. Um, and we took the position under 43A that we were a public authority um, e um, exercising a special statutory power. And the, uh, we, we, we put the argument two ways. We, 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 at trial and throughout, throughout every step of the court process, we argued that the plaintiff's case really was despite the express word of the pleading, words of the pleading, that um, in substance it was based on our exercise of a special statutory power to discharge under section 35, or alternatively, their case was an allegation that we failed to, to detain him pursuant to section 21. It had to be one or, the, one or the other. <laughs> and as I say, the plaintiff's case at, at first instance and on appeal was that there was no, no exercise of any statutory power involved, it was just plain old vanilla common law negligence on our part in uh, discharging Mr Pettigrew. Um, and uh, the defendant hospital had a glorious victory at trial, but only on uh, the Section 5.0 competent professional practice defence. Um, the trial judge rejected our 43A defence for reasons I can't now recall, but in any event, we got, we got back, when we got to the Court of Appeal, um, the defendant hospital came second again on 43A um, by a 2-1 majority, Justice McFarlane and, and the President um, agreeing with him. And that was the reasoning process uh, by which His Honour Justice McFarlane found that 43A was not engaged. I, I must say with respect that, that that reasoning ignores entirely the fact that um, The, the, our case was not simply that we discharged 
because it was, we were mandated to, it was it was necessary to do so pursuant to um, section 35 subsection 3 the the other aspect of the 43a argument we were putting was that in reality the plaintiff's case was that we failed to detain under section 21 and again if that was right even if we did um, negligently fail to detain under section 21 that engaged section 43a and the Wensbury unreasonable standard and there were six psychiatrists called in the case four of whom gave evidence to the effect that in the same circumstance they probably would have discharged um, but the most or more instructive judgment in my in my respectful submission is uh, that of the uh, the dissenting judge justice garling who um, I say he got it right largely because he upheld our <laughs> our arguments. But the, the short point is that His Honour recognised that it was either one or the other. The, the, the plaintiff's case, as it was put, was either um, a contention that we negligently failed to keep him in, uh, in which case Section 21 was engaged, or that we negligently discharged, which, in which case Section 35 was engaged, and you know, either way Section 43 was engaged. <laughs> Um, I won't labour the reasoning, but um, what, what I, and this is all set out in the paper anyway, but the, 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 the point uh, to emphasise is that despite the plaintiff's pleading making no reference to the statutory power to detain, Justice Garling would have upheld our, um, the, the defendant's uh, defence to the effect that the plaintiff's case was premised upon the hospital having failed to exercise um, a power um, and I, I, in my uh, review of it, I, I, I think that McKenna, the Court of Appeal decision in McKenna is instructive as to, uh, or at least provides an example of where resort to the pleaded case doesn't really shed any light on what the, um, the true basis of the case against the, the public authority is. That it's, If you don't stand back from the pleading and really think about what, what is that being put against the public authority, then you run the risk of... of the true basis being obscured, and, and I think that you, defendants who are acting, for, or p people acting for public authorities, need to be conscious, conscious that plaintiff, plaintiffs shouldn't be permitted by some pleading device to, to um, circumvent the protections under 43A. Um, the second issue, and I'll, I'll be quick, quickly on this. The second issue that um, ar arises, or in the Weber decision, um, it is the, the, and indeed the second aspect of the process of reasoning by which the court in Weber held that Section 43A was not engaged, um, was by determining that the council's activities that were impugned in the proceedings um, did not involve the exercise of a power conferred by a statute. Um, and importantly, Justice Mac, uh, Justice Baston. Uh, said in Weber that there's a distinction to be drawn between the activities which are reliant for their law lawfulness on a statutory power and those which can be undertaken in accordance with the general law. And he gave the example of a, a you know, a council officer um, driving a vehicle on a public road um, that, to the effect that beyond the licensing requirements applicable to all drivers, um, there's no statutory authority uh, special to the council that's required for that to occur. And um, similarly, in the present case, the steps required to be taken on the tip were steps which could readily be taken by the owner or a person having management of the land for waste disposal purposes without any specific statutory power. And I think the underlying words in the extract on that slide sort of bring into stark relief the distinction that between the mental health legislation that was considered in Weber, for example, and the facts, oh, sorry, the, in McKenna, for example, and the matters that arose in Weber, because whereas the detention of a mentally ill patient uh, could only lawfully occur pursuant to legislation, as Garling J found in um, McKenna, then um, that, that was not the case in, in Weber. In, in short, every man and his dog could operate a tip and you didn't need <laughs> um, statutory power to do it. Uh, there is a quite interesting um, review by, well, c consideration by uh, Justice Baston, uh, in this context, about the circumstances in which particular things done by councils will and will not be pursuant to special statutory powers, and he he gave these um, examples that are all set out in the paper. Um, 
Um, but the, the ultimate conclusion was that it follows that the precautions which the council failed to undertake upon which the liability identified above was based did not involve the failure to exercise any special, special statutory power and accordingly section 43A was not engaged. And I, I think the one take out f from that is that it's a reminder that it's unsafe to assume that all activities that are undertaken, undertaken by a public authority um, will, will always involve a special statutory power and, and it's almost mandatory that in, in every case that the issue will turn on the nature of the activity that's being impugned by the plaintiff on the pleadings. Um, and for example, the, um, in the example that Justice Baston gave about a, a council officer not needing anything other than um, ordinary um, a vehicle driver driver license uh, to operate a council vehicle on a public road. Um, if if one the council is sued vicariously for the <laughs> havoc wreaked by a council officer driving a car down a public road, one would not ordinarily expect 43A to be available to uh, as a defence. Uh, and without more, and I think. We're supposed to be asking people if there are any questions. Hopefully for Justin. <laughs> because if there's not, there's, um, there's some drinks and food and things. Thanks. <laughs>